morning. Uh, Jim has been working in, in the Great Lakes now for over 20 years with stock assessment tools, and he, I'll give you the floor. Jim, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Um, as the title says, I'm going to be talking about stock assessment methods and their use of management, um, and particularly with their application. Um, like whitefish in 1836 treaty waters. Um, I was a little surprised and honored to be invited to give this talk uh, at this symposium. I never really thought of myself as an expert. Um, but then I kind of sat down with my CV and I listed all the papers that had something to do with Corrigonids. Um, and it got to be a fairly long list, but you'll notice my name isn't first on any of them. <laughs> uh, so this is by way of acknowledgement. Uh, this isn't possible without working with a whole lot of people. Um, and particularly a lot of the work you're going to see today um, depends on the work in 1836 treaty waters by all of the personnel in the modeling subcommittee. Um, and I thank them for all their efforts in letting me steal their work. Say letting me steal their work, I just took it. <laughs> so you've probably seen this map a bunch of times so far. The map of the 1836 treaty, treaty waters of the Great Lakes makes up a fair portion of Michigan waters of um, Lake Michigan, Superior, and Huron. Um, in the 1836 treaty waters, the process for setting harvest regulating guidelines or, or total allowable catches um, involves fitting stock assessment models, statistical catch and age models, some of you may have heard of them described as integrated assessment models. Um, the basic process is, is that the data are used through the end of one year in the fall of the next year to set the, har provide the harvest guidance for the following year. So there's basically a full year lag between when the data come in and when the assessment uh, results are actually used in management. And that really has some implications because it builds in some lag um, between what we know about what's happening to the system and what, and what we're doing in the future. And so the harvest uh, guidance is based on some projections of what we think recruitment is going to be based on averages of past grades. I'm going to be giving you a lot of results from simulation studies in this talk. And this, this is, and the simulation results are both in terms of the performance of different procedures for, in terms of fishery management quantities, things like yield, or, the, or, or conservation measures, things like spawning stock biomass, but it also um, yields results on how well the assessment methods work. So how large are the errors in estimating the spawning stock biomass, for example. So this diagram here sort of outlines a process um, where you have, you build into your simulations to evaluate management strategies, uh, a population model, and that can track the age age structure of the population over time. And each year, you also simulate the process of generating data, and you apply within your simulation model the, the assessment model, so it gives you results each year on how well you're doing. And so each, the way these models work is you're fitting the, day, you're fitting the models with time series of data, and the way we typically do this is we keep the most recent 20 years of data in the in the simulations and base each year's assessment of the status of the stock based on that 20 year time series, which sort of emulates the way we do things when we do real assessments, because we've always believed that those people from 30 years ago didn't know what we were, they were doing, and we just used the most recent 20 years. Or more realistic, we were actually more worried about um, the system changing in ways that we're not capturing in the models. So in summary, we're going to talk, when I talk about stock assessment models, I'm going to be, oh, let me go back. I want to say a little bit more about that slide. So in addition to sort of emulating the assessment process, you're also 
you're simulating this forward, you're also able to capture other things about the system um, that you're interested in as you assess the system in a particular way and as you, you respond to your assessment information uh, based on a particular rule. For example, we, based on the assessed stock size, we might say we, we're going to make the maximum fission mortality rate be 65% um, of, of the extant population as estimated, and then we can actually look inside the, inside the simulation results and ask, well, what does that lead to in terms of average yield, or what does that lead to in terms of risk of reaching low stock sizes? So, I'm going to first talk about the stock assessment performance, not, not the management performance. And, and in particular, when I'm talking about the stock assessment, I'm talking about fitting a population model to observe data, and we're working with the time series of data, and we're adjusting the parameters of the assessment model to um, best match uh, the data, and this is going to be parameterized in such a way that the model is useful um, in terms of providing management advice. There's a little more detail on the kind of stock assessment model we're working with, with whitefish in the 1836 Treaty Waters. This is actually, uh, on the left side, some population estimate from the uh, model that was used to set um, or provide harvest guidance for the 2016 fishing season. And so on the left side, it actually shows the estimates of the population over time. And so you can kind of think of this as the, the model is set up to estimate population abundance at age over time and it runs based on known drivers and in the case of this particular assessment model the known, known drivers are the observed effort values and then there are parameters that um, determine both how the population uh, changes over time and what we get to observe based on the population. Now, on the right hand side are plots of um, the observed data and fits of the model to the observed data. And in this particular graph, I ran out of time, so I'm just showing you proportions at age from the gillnet fishery and the cat or the yield from over time from the gillnet fishery. And I'm showing you a few example years. The top 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 graph in the age compositions illustrates you can get predictions for uh, years and quantities you don't actually have data for, and the, the basic process is done automatically in fitting these models is that the parameters are adjusted to match the data, which they do pretty well in this particular case. Um, and when you're all done, we have, have estimates of quantities of things that we care about, things like fish mortality rates, um, abundance and age, spawning stock biomass, and so on. So I'm going to go inside of that just a little bit to, to, because, because I'm going to talk about some of the parameters and how we're modeling them and we need to know what those parameters mean. So basically, the population model is simply following the cohorts that recruit each year or the cohorts that were present at the beginning of the time series. And those cohorts decrease in abundance as represented by the decreasing sizes of the boxes as we go from left to right, which means older and later in time. And we have losses due to natural mortality and losses due to fishing, both of which need to be captured in the model. And I'm going to particularly focus on fishing mortality here today. Um, the equation at the top simply says that the abundance in the cohort next year uh, and the next older age is equal to the abundance in the previous year, one, one age younger, in the same cohort, times the proportion that survive. And then we do all this X stuff to kind of complicate it make sure we keep our jobs. Um, the instantaneous uh, mortality rate rep represented by Z is composed of uh, pieces that are due to different components of the fishery as well as different components of natural mortality. And that sort of is broken apart. We've suppressed the subscripts for age and year here just to make it simpler. And so in this case, uh, the total mortality rate is being decomposed into an additive set of fit, two fishing mortality rates for two fisheries. Generally, in the treaty water models, that would be a trap net and a gillnet fishery. Um, 
Then, in some cases, we've incorporated sea lamprey mortality um, based on, uh, on information on moving rates, and then a background mortality rate. So the starting point in these kind of assessment models for modeling fish and mortality rate is a separable model, which we move away from rapidly because it isn't very realistic. Uh, but this is a starting point and sort of as a basis. And so years ago in the 1970s and 80s, these kind of separable models were put forward in statistical catch and age models because we quickly realized that if you need to estimate a fish and mortality rate for every age of year, you, you have as many estimates as you have age composition data points, and that doesn't work very well. And so the approach that's been taken, that was taken, was to say we're going to decompose the fish and mortality rate into a product of a year effect, F sub y, and an age effect, selectivity, which is represented by S sub a there. And so basically the selectivity of the relative vulnerability of different ages, and the F or year effect is the fishing intensity in any given year, and if we set the relative selectivities to have a maximum value of 1, then you can think of that fishing intensity, or F value, as a fishing mortality rate on the, max, on the fully selected age. Okay, so now we've got sort of this picture here, and this represents constant selectivity for two potentially different years, which have the same selectivity patterns, same relative fishing mortality rates on different ages, but the F sub Y value is, is twice as high, in one year than another, so the whole curve has been shifted up. All the values have been doubled. Now I'm going to talk a bit more about the uh, fishing intensity. In particular, um, the standard approach to fishing in intensity in, in the historical models was a model that is a, as proportional to the amount of fishing effort, the capital E there, with, with some stochastic variation or white noise around it. The problem with that is that essentially uh, treats fishing mortality as proportional to abundance, um, which, or sorry, catch per effort as, as proportional to abundance, which it generally is not going to stay stable that way, uh, either due to density dependence or environmental change. So one approach to trying to deal with this kind of temporal variability and how and the fishing power is to replace this kind of white noise assumption with a random walk. And essentially what we do is that stochastic variability around the average has now been replaced with stochastic change from one year to the next. Um, and so we're now going to, going to talk a little bit about this um, and how it performs. This shows the estimated catchability, which is really the, that, that Q times that stochastic variability, the sort of the fishing power, and how it has been estimated to have changed in the North Huron Lake Whitefish model. Um, and you can see we estimated a fairly large radical change over time, and there are good reasons to have expected these sorts of change. Changes in water clarity, uh, changes in, in net following uh, with, from filamentous algae and things like that really you know, made it harder to catch fish. Um, but the question is, okay, does it really work? And this is where we kind of turn the simulations to address that question. So um, we, we address this through a simulation study. And in the simulation study, um, in this particular case, I'm showing you the results. And I'm going to try to move through this slide, which is pretty complicated, fairly fast. Um, so the y-axis gives us the, the difference in the median absolute relative error between the white noise model and the random walk model. What that means is values are high, say that the random walk model outperformed the white noise model. And the different symbols on the graph represent different assumptions about in the, in the simulations about what really happened to catchability. And so basically what this shows is for a lot of different conditions which represent um, combinations of fishing level, low, medium, and high, from half natural mortality to double natural mortality, and for uh, different assumptions about whether we have a survey or not from good, poor, to none, the um, 
the random walk model outperforms white noise um, when there's substantial change, and it does about as well when there isn't. And that's the bottom line from that slide. Just to remind you, I talked about two things, catchability and selectivity. And so we also were concerned about changes in selectivity over time. This slide shows estimated selectivity patterns from the North Huron model, um, just as an example. And it shows a fairly radical estimated changes in selectivity over time. And we did some simulation work that also verified light for catchability that in fact we can estimate changes in selectivity accurately over time. And in fact, uh, although, the, um, random, although the, the random walk model works pretty well, it, in, in both the case of catchability and selectivity, we can do a bit better if we go through some model selection procedures. Um, because every once in a while maybe things aren't really changing that much. So some of the newer and future directions um, include modeling selectivity as, an, as a function of mean length at age rather than just as a function of age given the large changes in size and age in Lake Whitefish. We're also been considering the possibility of length, length based or age and length based models where the actual internal dynamics are driven by length. Um, uh, you're going to hear a little bit more about attempts to do that with Cisco in the next talk. Um, and then there's also ideas of dropping the whole idea of, of separability entirely and, and simply modeling catchability at age um, as a multivariate stochastic process. This is sort of some of the advances that are coming down the pike. We haven't actually implemented those yet in Lake Whitefish models. So my take home message is, on, on this part of the talk, is that um, we can address changes um, sort of large changes, and we can actually do things. In these cases, we're working with like whitefish models with fishery-dependent data only, and we're accounting for the fact that we're using fishery data by allowing catchability to change. We can do this, um, but we needed to embrace uh, the change and not ignore it. I have a little section, I, I, I have this slide here, and I'm going to make a decision right now to, to skip over this bit. We've done a bunch of work on data weighting, processing, and information content, and the data matters. I think you're all happy to hear that. The data matters a lot, and how we handle the data matters a lot. Um, so sometimes the devil is in the details, but in the interest of getting to the other stuff, I'll go on. So, I want to talk a little bit about spatial structure. Up to now, I've been acting as though we have stocks and the fish know where the border lines are of the stocks and they don't move out of it. And as you are all aware, um, that's not the case. And this is sort of a diagram of spatial movement, and particularly what we're thinking of in the case of Lake Whitefish is there are spawning grounds in different, in, in different management regions and that the solid lines on this graph represent fish moving from the spawning grounds out to somewhere else, and the dashed lines represent fish moving from somewhere else into the region of the spawning grounds during the fishing season. So you end up with a mixed stock that's being harvested. Um, and our idea here is we're trying to account for movement of fish away from the spawning grounds during the fishing season, but and then they return back to spawn. We're not accounting for straying. That's not what we're thinking about here. We're just trying to deal with the mixed fishery aspect. So Mark Ebner did a, um, led a study in um, northern Michigan and northern Lake Huron where he, he asked the question, um, how, much, how often do the fish stay in the management unit where they um, are spawning? And so he tagged fish on spawning, or he worked with a whole group of people to tag fish on spawning ground, and then estimated um, what fraction of those fish were harvested or, or were present in, in, in that region during the, um, during the harvest season. And he estimated what I will call stay rates that depended on the stock that varied between 22 and 90 percent. And it's interesting that the 22 percent for the big bay to not that's just north, north, north of Green Bay um, is much lower than it was than, than a similar estimate from the 1980s. <laughs> 
So we got a lot of movement, and the movement rates have not remained constant over time and vary in space. Um, Mark worked with all kinds of people on Lake Huron to expand that study, and all I'm going to really say about this slide is across Lake Huron, when we look at fish that were stocked in different places and um, look at what fraction of the fish are actually staying in that region during the harvest area, it sort of matches the earlier publication um, where from 20 to 80 percent are staying. So there's a lot of variability in how many, you know, in different management areas, how how, how close to home the fish stay. And, sorry, I went a little too fast there. And this is work that's just coming out from uh, a PhD student of mine, uh, Yang Lee, and she has also done some work trying to explain the causes for the temporal and spatial variability in the movements uh, of those fish. And, um, is finding some pretty interesting results, so you can stay tuned for a whole talk about that sometime. So we try to account for this by looking at three different ways of assessing stocks, where we had separate models, pooled models, and a model that actually correctly accounted for the mixing. And there's a reason why this slide only shows the separate and the pooled models, and that's because when there was substantial mixing, the model that correctly accounted for the mixing didn't work very well. And in retrospect, I guess we should have known that, because the problem is, you have no way, when you're, if you're looking at only fishery data collected in, from the mixed stock, you have no way to know um, from that, those kind of data, whether you, when you see a lot of young fish, whether that's because you got a lot of young fish recruiting in that area, or you got a lot of young fish recruiting somewhere else that you that, that move there, sort of an unidentified model. Um, and what we next did was attempt to count for um, what we could do if we had data that was population specific. And so this says, what's the estimation of performance if you had genetic data? And it's genetic data in quotes because all it means is we have a sample of data where we're classifying the harvest in a region back to where it came from. Um, and one way you might be able to do that is, is with genetics, but it's not the only thing. And we try, this slide is kind of complicated. It shows, int, shows the interquantile ranges of the relative error in the spawning stock biomass on the top graph. And there's, we did multiple uh, assessment approaches and with details that don't matter here. What matters is across that top panel, the left two, pan left two graphs, left two bars represent the case where we were using the genetic data and the right two bars or, or, or um, represent the cases where we weren't using the genetic data. And pretty much, and then as we go from left to right, the details don't matter here, but we looked at it. the first one is high, high data quality, the second one is low data quality, then we allow some variation in the mixing rates from year to year, and we made different assumptions in the third and, or fourth and fifth one about, about uh, recruitment variation, and then the last one uses a different target mortality rate. But the bottom line is we got better results when we had, substantially better results when we had the genetic data than we did when we were using these models that it correctly accounted for movement. And we had to actually, in this particular graph, in order to have this comparison, we actually had to have fairly low movement rates, about a 70% stay rate, because when we use the higher stay rates, of course, without the genetic data, it doesn't even work. Um, the bottom row there is looking at the autocorrelation in the assessment of results. And not, so not only did we do better in terms of the errors, but we also had less correlation over time in the errors when we were using the genetic data. So we didn't keep making the same mistake over and over. I just wanted to remind you that we're doing this in sort of a full loop cycle, so we, which also includes um, tracking what's happened to the population so we can evaluate some of the things that happened to the performance of, of, of the stocks as well as um, the assessment results. And 
I'm going to only talk about the top graph here. And, and basically, the bottom line here is we looked at different control rules. This is some work, work historical work that from 2012. We looked at different control rules. And the constant fishing mortality rate rule, which is basically what we're using in the treaty waters, uh, produces the highest, highest yield levels. Um, and when we tried to use policies, um, that gave us more stable yields. Um, we in, it, they in fact achieved that, but they achieved that at a substantial cost in terms of the average yield. And this is just, so if, for example, if you want to use one of the rules, the F limb rule is, is you can't change by more than 15%. Another rule is um, a conditional constant catch, which says use a constant catch policy except when things get bad and then you go you have a limit on the fishing mortality rate. And basically, what this graph is showing is, is you do better with a, a constant fishing mortality rate in terms of yield, but there there's, is some cost in terms of more variability. And the dashed line there is basically the status quo policy. What this doesn't show, it looks really like the status quo policy is really good, but this averages over different productivity in different populations, and so it hides the fact um, that some of those populations are actually being depleted, um, which we've explored further in a bunch of other simulations. I'm going to kind of cut to the chase on this one. And simply, this is further work where, where Kyle Moulton was looking at, in his master's work, he was looking at assessing uh, unit Assessments were done as unit stocks with mixing occurring. And what he concluded um, was the mixing really had second order effects. What really mattered, what was the target fishing mortality rate and what was the productivity. And what happened with the mixing is you couldn't tell that the productivity in your stock was low and you were depleting a stock because you were, you were sort of living off the migrants. And so what you see across the top is we sustain high levels of yield across all areas, and, but on the bottom, you'll see that when you fish hard, um, it's actually on the bottom, I guess I should point to something. Uh, so we'll see down here, for example, um, across here, we, this is, these high values are high probabilities of, of, of the stocks being depleted. So let, uh, less than 20% um, of the unfished spawning stock size. And um, we end up, particularly for, for the higher fishing mortality rate, 65% here, we end up with high probabilities of that happening. But we still sustain a lot of yield for fish and fish from other stocks in those areas. So the strategies evaluated in these management strategy evaluations, these simulation work that I just showed you, were based on thinking that there was some degree of stationarity out there. Um, but we all know that's not as true as we'd like it to be. So what I'm showing you in this graph are the estimates for, for the 2017 assessment cycle across all of the stocks in the, in the treaty waters for which we had estimates. And the top row here gives estimates of recruitment, weighted age, and spawning stock biomass for the Michigan and Huron stocks, and the bottom here is for the Superior stocks. So we're kind of managing, as though we sort of have a relatively stable system, like this seems to be the case in Superior, where in fact, um, in two of the lakes, we had very large increases and then decreases in recruitment, large changes in weighted age, and as a consequence, large changes in the spawning stock biomass. Um, and so I would argue that in the future, we may need to take into account and actually adjust our policies for changes in the productivity. Um, that's something that these strategies can attack, but they can only attack it if we come up with imaginative policies to try to account for the changes in productivity. This slide shows the log of the recruitment per stock size versus stock size accumulated over all the stocks in Michigan and Huron. And basically, it just illustrates that we had low, low 
relatively low productivity in the 80s, it increased. We saw the massive boom in the whitefish stock. Then as the population got larger, compensation kicked in and the recruits for spawner went down. But then something else has changed out there and so our recruitment for spawner productivity has actually gotten worse. Um, and so there really is something else besides uh, sort of stability to deal with. So in conclusion, some takeaways. Stock assessment models can account for temporal change. Management strategy evaluation is a powerful tool for evaluating alternatives. There's lots of mixing out there. When there is mixing, we can pool areas and perhaps do okay. Um, but really to assess the populations uh, that mix, we need population specific data. And finally, um, we need new strategies to address the kinds of changes that we've experienced in Lakes Huron and Michigan. Thank you. If you have any questions for Jim, uh, track them down on the break.